All the things are working. <laughs> I'm out of breath. I just ran down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Give me a minute. <laughs> just a few last-minute things to take care of. Oh, welcome to live broadcasting. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Learning Space. Uh, I am uh, one of your hosts, Kogalucci. I'm a postdoc with the Cosmo Quest Citizen Science Project. And I have with me my uh, co-worker through the wall, George Bracey. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> and uh, we have a special guest today, uh, Rachel Zimmerman Brockman, who is at NASA, Steve JPL. Yes. OK, so uh, we need to, I think I can unmute you. Yeah, yeah sweet. I have the power. Um, so uh, we thank you for joining us at our new earlier time. Uh, we have been switching things around a bit for a couple of reasons. One is that we we realized that uh, our previous broadcast time was so, so late for you guys watching in Europe. And we are uh, also working on getting some more guests from the EU, from our, our European partners. So we're yeah. trying to pick a time that's funnier for them. And uh, also, uh, since I have my own office this semester, I don't have to wait till everyone goes home to broadcast. Although... The reason I was running down the hall is George remembered, oh, they vacuum on Wednesday afternoon. So I ran down the hall to ask the guy to, just to skip our offices. So, so you mean outside, but I said, don't worry about that. that but I, told, I can't believe we didn't see that coming. <laughs> oh, I didn't see it. Yeah, I, I totally forgot that Wednesday was vacuuming day. I just told him to skip our offices. He's like, oh, I could do the other side. I'm like, no, no, no. So I'm at breath and a little discombobulated, more so than usual. But thank you for watching today. As usual, you guys can uh, use the Q&A app to send us questions and comments. I see hellos already from Michael and Guido and Nancy. Welcome, you guys. Uh, I hope, Guido, you were in Germany uh, particularly enjoying the, the earlier time slot, so it's the evening yeah. for you now. Um, uh, you can uh, check the uh, event page for the Hangout. And I think I had the event page up for the other one earlier, Learning Space. Um, I will occasionally check there for comments, not as much anymore. I'm pretty much into the Q&A app because that's accessible anywhere this is embedded. So uh, do feel free to use that. I'll try and post some links in the comments as we go, and we'll include them in the show notes as well for the video and audio afterwards. OK, that's all yeah. the business end of things. <laughs> um, I got a demo for you today, but I will encourage you to seek out a local Yuri's Night party this Saturday near you. Uh, yeah, Yuri's Night is a celebration of the first human in space uh, on uh, April 12th uh, was was his, his launch and his orbit, his orbit of the Earth. Uh, we are, George and I are going to be enjoying with telescopes, um, meteorites, and frozen custard. I think. I'm custard. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah. I've always been yeah. out of town. Gosh, I think our third. Yeah, I third was out of town for the first two. Third year. Yeah. And Annie Frozen Custard in Edwardsville, Illinois. So if you're at all local, <laughs> you're at all local. <laughs> over and join us. Yeah, but it'll be so. great. Lots of parties going on all over the world for this night. So just Google Yuri's Night. They'll take you right to their site. Uh, parties all over the world. Yeah. Um, last year in San Antonio, we got a drink special on White Russians <laughs> at a bar uh, during NSTA. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, no, I'll be around for the frozen custard this year. So check that out. That's my thing. And you kind of have some hands-on material. I have some clay, some modeling clay that was sent to me in a kit from Night Sky Network. We had them on the show a while back. Um, and I got the Space Rock kit for our for our group. And uh, I have some modeling clay. So I'm going to be making scale model asteroids, Vesta and Ceres and, and the like. Uh, so that'll be hands-on activity later on. I'll show you, I'm sure I'll show you pictures. Okay, so that's all the front business. Uh, we came here to talk about the Scientist for a Day contest um, through Cassini. So, Rachel, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks so much for yeah. having me. Uh, so, can I'm you, really, uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, okay. go ahead. I'm glad you can hear me. Uh, first of all, I was one on the founding committee for Yuri's Night way back over a hey. dozen years ago. Oh, so nice. Glad to see that it's still going strong all oh, these yeah. Um, so yeah, so I work on the Cassini mission to Saturn here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And I've been working on Cassini since about 2006. Um, to give you a little backstory. we launched the spacecraft uh, from Florida in October of 1997. And it took seven years to get from Earth to Saturn. 
we went toward the sun and did a gravity assist around Venus and then another gravity assist around Earth before slingshotting out to the outer solar system and doing another gravity assist around Jupiter and then uh, heading out toward Saturn. So we've been orbiting Saturn since the middle of 2004. So this coming June, late June, early July, we'll be celebrating our 10th anniversary of orbiting wow. Saturn. So hopefully all of you have seen some of the beautiful pictures that have come from the mission. Gorgeous picture, pictures of Saturn and its rings and its moons. Uh, amazing discoveries like what you've heard recently in the news about Enceladus having not just active ice geysers but probably a subsurface ocean, which is very exciting. Um, yeah. All sorts of new information about Saturn's largest moon, Titan, which has its own atmosphere. And uh, even things like the, the hexagon around the north pole of Saturn, which is really an amazing thing because like, who would expect a nice geomet you know, geometrical figure on the north pole of the planet, right? But there it is. Yeah. So the Cassini Scientist for Day essay contest has been going on since 2006. It's been offered once or twice a year, every year since then. And this is going to be the 13th time we're offering the contest, but the first time we're doing a Google Hangout about it. So I'm really excited about this. Yay. All right. So this is in celebration of 10 years at Saturn with the Cassini spacecraft. We are having a special contest this spring. The topics for this year's contest are Saturn's rings, specifically the F ring, uh, Saturn's moon Titan, specifically the kind of north polar region of Titan where the lakes are. And then the third target is Saturn itself, again from the north, because that's the Cassini spacecraft is flying over from the north pole, both of Saturn and Titan. And so we're going to be able to see the hexagon. Mm -hmm. There's a, a giant hurricane inside the hexagon, like right at the north pole, which is fascinating. So we're hoping to learn about all three of these places. Now, when we run this contest, it's for students in fifth through twelfth grade. And I say that with a little asterisk next old. To because <laughs> we have had fourth grade students enter and win the contest. So Ooh, wow. So we're fifth through twelve. It's actually we've had fourth grade students enter and win. Um, in fact, last year we had a student from just outside of Chicago uh, who was one of our winners. And it turns out that although she won in the fifth and sixth grade category, she's actually a fourth grade student. Wow. Uh, so that yeah. So there's the the flyer about the contest, so you can kind of see. You've got uh, about that. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about right now. So the three targets are Saturn's rings, Titan, and Saturn. Um, on our website, we have two different videos. One is an introduction of the contest by Linda Spilker, who's the chief scientist for the mission. So she's the, the head scientist on the mission to Saturn. And she talks about kind of some of the, the, the basic outline of the contest itself. She's one of our judges also, so she helps read some of our essays. We have over 25 judges who are on the Cassini team or and or Education and Public Outreach team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who read all these essays. So last time we ran the contest we had over 2,000 students write essays. We had 675 essays to be read and so we split those up into 25 to 50 essays per judge for the first round and then a smaller number for the second and third rounds yeah. until we had our winners. So uh, what we do for teachers who want to make it a class assignment we ask that they send us their top three essays per class. So if you teach six different sections of physics, you can send us six, you know, you know, 18 essays, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that our judges don't have to read every single essay written by the students, so it makes it easier for our judges. Um, it also makes it easier for the teachers, since they have to use our online entry form to enter all these essays. We don't want them to have to type, you know, 30, <laughs> 35, 40 teacher, you know, students per class worth of essays. They just send us their top three essays per class, and then there's a place on our entry form to put the names of all the other students in the class who wrote essays that aren't in the top three, so they all get certificates of participation. Oh, that's cool. It also gives us very accurate metrics as to how many students wrote essays, because we can point to these are the students in this class that wrote essays. So we know whether it's one student in the class or whether it's the whole class that wrote the essays. Yeah, and you have um, students can do this in groups, I think? Yes, yeah, they can Is work right? alone or in groups of up to four. Up to four, okay. Yeah. And in some cases, if you want to make it more than that, the, the entry form just has room for the four names, but if you have additional students, like we had a student, a, a class last year of special ed students, and they worked in groups of eight, and that's fine with us. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. The, the, entry, the uh, certificate form has room for four names, but then because you can add additional names, you can put the names of the other students who wrote essays um, in that box, and that was separated by commas, and that'll give you a PDF of all of the certificates of, of all the students who enter the contest. So if you want to make it more than four, you can, uh, but we only list four in our, you know, you know, on the entry form. Yeah. 
So yeah, you can definitely work in groups. I would love to see classes do a class debate about if they could only take one of these three pictures, which one would they want to take and why? Uh -huh. I love that you already did a sample video of that amongst Cassini scientists. Um, so there's another. So uh, apologies for not being able to, to show video because the sound broke last time and I haven't figured it out yet. But anyway, when you go look at this page in the videos afterwards, um, they've also looks like you've also added a view of the scientists debating which of the three they would choose. That's right. So from the main page at the top, there's kind of a yellow navigation bar, and one of the choices is teachers, and that gives you the list of all the national science and English standards that are met by participants contest. But then under topics, that starts off with a video. It's an eight-minute video. It's both captioned and has a transcript and a glossary. Um, and so this is under topics. Yeah, right there. So you can see this is Carl Murray, Zibby Turtle, and Bridget Hessman. And Carl Murray is a Saturn ring specialist. And he, he's particularly interested in the F ring, which is why he's talking on the video. We have Zibby Turtle, who's a Titan expert and Bridget Hessman, who specializes in Saturn. And the three of them have a discussion that we've edited down to eight minutes, so you can do it in class or outside of class, depending on how teachers want to do it. And they're talking about why they think we should choose their picture to take. So the way this works is the Cassini spacecraft takes all three pictures, but we frame the contest that if we could only take one of these three pictures, which one do you think we should take and why? Mm -hmm. And so students write an essay of no more than 500 words, so like a two-page essay, on why they think we should choose either Saturn's F-ring or Titan or Saturn. And we've had some very creative essays in the past. One student wrote a poem instead of an essay. That was fine. Um, creativity is encouraged. Actually, one of the winners in Brazil last year wrote a poem instead of an essay. Wow. So this is due April 17th. It's due April 17th, which is next Thursday. I know that's not much time, but it is enough time. As I said, it's only a two-page essay. This year, for the first time, we also put some research background on our website, instead of having students go on Google and try to find information on Titan, they can come right to our own website. Okay. So at the top of the topics page, uh, the target overview is the, the video, and then you can click to get the glossary. We understand that, you know, although we ask the people in the video to remember that their audience might be as young as 10 years old, some of them still talk, you know, at a different level. <laughs> so Anyone like that. They talk about things like northern summer. Well, students know what the word northern means, and they know what the word summer means, but they've probably never heard northern summer discussed before. And sure. so this is when it's summer in the, in the northern hemisphere, right? Because we can't just say it's summer on Saturn because half the, you know, it's winter on the south pole of Saturn at the same time that it's summer on the north pole of Saturn. So we have some background information on you know, Saturn and on uh, the F-ring and on Titan that the students can use as background when they're doing research for finding out why they want to, you know, have us take these pictures. We found that in previous years, without that guidance, they would go to Wikipedia and copy it down all the facts they could find, you know, about the temperature and the mass and the distance and all the radius and things. And that doesn't help us decide why we should take this picture, right? You're so probably looking for a nicely... Yeah, a nicely reasoned argument as to exactly. why, because that is again part of the standards, um, exactly. you know, for writing and science, um, arguing from reason, and so something that you know shows communication, good communication skills. I saw in the, the FAQ somebody asked about grammar, right? And so grammar and punctuation important also because it's part of the communication. So, so there's some research involved, but then putting it into a nicely easily understood argument almost about what your choice is. Right. I know in, in school they usually de you know compartmentalize, okay, now it's time for English class, yeah. and now it's time for science class. What they don't realize is that real scientists do a lot of writing. They write grant proposals to get the money to do their research in the first place. They do, um, uh, they, they need to write posters and papers discussing what it is that they've learned, the summarizing their conclusions of their research. And without that, they can't get more funding to do future work that they want to do. And yep. so writing is a very big part of being a scientist. So mm -hmm. we've had some schools that have made this essay contest a, a joint contest between, like a joint assignment between the English teacher and the science teacher. Because you can go to the English teacher and get help making sure that it's, you know, a, you know it doesn't have to be a five paragraph essay. But, you know, if they're learning about the five paragraph essay format with a nice introduction and three paragraphs explaining your reasoning and then a conclusion, they can go to their English teacher for help with that, but for yeah. the science content, they can go to their science teacher and say, is this right? 
Yeah, and that's, that's nice. We had a school in Alaska last year that participated in the contest, and they had 125 essays from one school. And wow. that was because the science teacher and English teacher partnered up and gave double credit. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> in science, you get credit for English class and for science class. That works. That uh, works. Yeah. No, some teachers <coughs> choose to just let their students know about it, but not make it a class assignment. That's fine. They can do it for extra credit or not. That's up to them. Uh, but it is it is nice when it's a class assignment because then the whole class is interested in the outcome of the discussion because what the winners win mm. is not just getting their essays posted on our website, which they do, but the winners and their classes win a video conference, hour-long question and answer session with NASA scientists to ask their questions about Cassini and Saturn and what it's like to work at NASA to the experts. So they get a chance to also be online with the other eight winners because we have three different age categories, grade 5 and 6, grade 7 and 8 and high school, and Within that, we have one winner per topic. So we'll have a winner about the F ring, a winner about Titan, and a winner about Saturn for each of the three age groups. Okay. And that way, we'll have we'll end up with nine winners. Nine winners, right? And or nine classrooms that are winners. If an essay is written by four students, then we'll have more than nine winners. Mm -hmm. But the um, the winners all get a certificate that says that they won the contest. And likewise, the semifinalists and finalists also get certificates that have their status in the contest, not just partic participation. Every student who writes an essay, whether they're in the top three in their class or not, gets a certificate of participation in the contest. Um, this is the first year that we're making those certificates available online mm -hmm. as soon as the teacher enters the essays so that they get immediate feedback. You enter the contest, NASA cares what you think, here's your certificate. But we also realize that not all teachers have access to a color printer and nice paper. And so they can email us and say, please mail us the certificates. And that will take a bit longer to get to them, but at least they'll have hard copies of the certificates that we print in color that we can mail to them if that's the way they choose to do it. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, you cover certain educational standards for, for teachers on the website as well. Can you talk a little bit about, about those standards? If you go up to the teacher link at the top of the website, it says benefits of participating in the contest. And it talks about all of the advantages of participating. So students will work with a real current NASA mission. They will apply their critical thinking skills. They'll learn how to conduct research. They'll gain confidence in their ability to do science. Um, I'm reading kind of the, the orange mm -hmm. box at the top of the page here. Um, they will watch videos by young Cassini scientists and engineers and see that scientists and engineers come from diverse backgrounds. Um, they will see that some scientists have different opinions and uh, what does it say? Different priorities, priorities yeah. like where their spacecraft will target images, right? Not all Cassini scientists are interested just in Saturn. Some of them are also interested in the rings or interested in the moons. They will learn something new and form questions about a place they may never have heard of before. So a lot of students know what Saturn is or think yeah. they know, but they don't know what Titan is. When they haven't really thought about the structure of the rings, they know Saturn has rings, but they don't really know what the rings are made of or how they orbit around Saturn along with the moons and things like that and that each ring is different. Um, so they each have different characteristics. And then each participating student receives a certificate with the images of the three uh, imaging targets from the essay topics in the contest. And then there's a chief scientist advisor's briefing on the website, which is kind of a, you know, welcome to the contest. And then if you click on uh, English and science education standards, it lists which one, for the different grade levels, uh, which ones are appropriate. We <laughs> could all know that a lot of standards do it as a class assignment if yeah. they know, you know, that it meets standards. So mm -hmm. if they if the principal comes in and says, "What are you teaching today?" You can say, "I'm teaching the the <laughs> you know grade five to eight content of uh, Earth and space science," or you can say, "I'm teaching about process," or "I'm teaching about you know science and inquiry, sure. or history and nature of science." So that's that's all built in. So they can point to the website and say, "These are the standards." standards we're meeting with this contest. This is very much like um, uh, like a mock, um, like I, I've, I've, I've never worked with a space mission before, but uh, doing telescope time proposals for ground-based telescopes, it's similar in concept for students to have to justify the reason that you're taking up this valuable science instrument to do your science. Well, that's the other nice thing, is that most of the time, the spacecraft is taking pictures for the science community. Mm -hmm. But once or twice a year, we get spacecraft time that is dedicated to the students of the world. Awesome. And it's great to see that, you know, these images belong to the students. You know, they belong to the world, but, the, you know, specifically, they belong to the students. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, now, the April 17th deadline is for the U.S. contest. Are there international branches? looks like there are international branches as well. Yes, at the top of the page, if you click on international, there's a list of contacts, and those are the national coordinators for the different countries that are involved. Mm. Let me see if I can find right, that. Cassini is, is partly an ESA mission as well. That's right. Okay, there we go. But last year, ESA had their own edition of the contest. Mm -hmm. Here, I think there are one or two. I don't see any European countries listed right now, but I know there are some that are uh, running the contest. I think Greece is running the contest again this year. Okay. We'll check with a national coordinator from last year who now works at JPL as a postdoc. <laughs> and she said she was you know, planning to do this again this year, but we haven't put her name on, on the list of, of participating countries yet. Okay. Um, I know there's one country that wanted to make their deadline later, but we haven't added that to the website yet. And I have to go back through my email and find out which country it was that wanted a later deadline. Okay. And see so that two, uh, one country has, uh, well, Brazil has today as a deadline, so mm -hmm. we'll be getting some essays from Brazil at some point soon. Now, those essays, if they're not going to the U.S. version of the contest, they go to the national coordinator for that, that country. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be a while till we hear back from that national coordinator who their winners are because they do their own judging of the winners and they right. just send us the winning essays to post on our website. I, um, I think you mentioned earlier, but I forgot, how many Bathony entries do you get? How many, oh, how many entries do we get? Mm -hmm. Well, we had about 2,000 entries okay. from the U.S. last year, but in other countries it, it can be significantly higher depending on you know, population of the country and interest in science. I know in Brazil they had, I think, 500 essays in the past. India's had 500 essays uh, per contest uh, over you know, several years. And I know we had like nine winners from Canada this, this past year. If you go back to the main page, you can see last year's winners. Mm -hmm. uh, so under 2013 edition recap, you can see the winners of the last U.S. contest and then the winners from participating countries. Oh, and then the, there's the European Space right. Agency's international so, contest. Yeah, winners from Brazil, from Canada, from Morocco, from Pakistan, uh, from Romania. Turkey and Venezuela. Okay. And I think Mauritania emailed us this week saying that they have winners that they want us to post on their website too. So it's a very global contest. We've had awesome. over many countries around the world participate in the contest in the past. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. Have you done any contest. judging? Hmm? Yes, we're hoping to run the contest again in the fall. So anybody who thinks that a week isn't enough time to pull their students together to write essays can certainly add their name to our email distribution list to find out what the topics for next fall's contest are going to be. Um, the email for the contest is scientist for a day at jpl.nasa.gov, and if you can put that somewhere where everybody can see it. Yeah, let me grab that from the yeah. chat. Um, it's also on our website, so if you just find the Cassini Scientist for a Day website, um, our email address is on there. So you can add your name to our email distribution list and find out, have more advanced notice about next year's contest. Uh, it sounds like uh, teachers are doing the submissions. Is Are there uh, options for... Um, Students to do it on their own outside of school or homeschool students, things like that? Yes, definitely. We, we do advertise the contest on homeschool contest websites and things like that. So it is definitely open to homeschools. And in that case, it would be the parent or the homeschool teacher who submits the essay for them. Um, for students who are doing it on their own, if their teacher is not interested or not willing or not able to post it, or let's say they finish it during spring break and they can't reach their teacher, uh, they can have the parent submit the essay for them and just put a note in the, in the notes field on the entry form that says this is being submitted by a parent. Okay. Um, so they yeah. have all the parents watching, even if yeah. your <laughs> teacher doesn't want to do it. I don't know why they would. There's, there's still a way to, to do this. I know teachers are, are, you know... They are so busy. Yeah. <laughs> they are so um, busy. Yeah. So the main thing is that we want to be able to reach the teacher in case their student wins so that they can mm -hmm. coordinate the video conference with a class for the winners, so that if we just have the parents' email address or, or phone number, then we won't be able to coordinate with the teacher very well. Mm -hmm. okay. But you can, usually, you can usually get a chain going if they know the teachers. Yeah, yeah. usually we can contact the parent and say, your student won, can you get in touch with the teacher and let them know, because of course they'd be proud of their student. And sure, also the scientist the comes to the class virtually, that's really, that's really great. We had a homeschool student, I think she was from Hawaii last year or the year before, who won the contest, and found a school that she could video conference with, and so that classroom got a chance to participate in the, the question and answer session. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, I, I see there's a question in the chat box about uh, language barriers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 
the contest in the United States is only open in English, but in other countries that are participating, uh, there are different language languages okay. that are acceptable. So in Brazil, you can write in Portuguese, for example. Yeah, I think he was asking that uh, Germany wasn't on the list of past winners. Um, yeah, so well, the European there is... Agency has their own page of winners, so it's possible that it's on the European Space Agency's mm -hmm. winning essays page. Okay. So do you, have you done any judging yourself for the contest? Yes, I have, yeah. Can, can you give um, general impressions of the kind of the kind of things you read? I love essays that are creative and original. Okay. I think, you know, I've read so many essays of, you know, this is how big Titan is, this is how cold Titan is. But what I really like to see is students who think about what it would be like you know, if you could stand on the surface of Titan and, you know, how much sunlight would you get? Well, you're nine times farther from the sun. So with a one over R squared relationship of, you know, amount of light you get, depending on how far away you are, you're going to get like 181st of the sunlight that you would get on Earth. And that's at the, the top of the atmosphere. Then you have to realize that it's cloudy all the way down. And so it would be very, very dim. And then occasionally, you know, a, the shadow of, of Saturn and its rings would pass in front of Titan and it would be even darker. And so what would it be like to be on this dim, dark world? And it would be cold, right, because you're nine times farther from the sun. And there are lakes, but the lakes on the surface of Titan are not made of water. They're made of liquid methane and liquid ethane. And so there are hydrocarbons on the surface, things that are made of hydrogen and carbon. So they're like organic molecules, but they're not necessarily biological. Mm -hmm. so they're chemical, but not necessarily biological. And then, of course, there's a the question of, is there life on Titan? Could there have been life on Titan? Could there be life on Titan in the future? Um, and that sort of thing. So that makes Titan a very intriguing choice to write about. Um, Saturn is, you know, a beautiful planet. We, I was expecting a lot of the younger students to write about Saturn because they, they kind of know what that is. Mm -hmm, or at mm -hmm. least they've seen it. And it's a very beautiful planet. And if you're going to take, you know, if you're going to draw a picture of a planet, you draw a circle and then you say, well, it's a circle, so you draw rings around it, right? That's how you know it's a planet. So you're drawing <laughs> Saturn. Is and yet, last time we had an essay contest, we found that a lot of students chose one of the moons that had a lot of mysteries associated with it. Oh, wow. Okay. One of the topics was Iapetus, which has a dark side and a light side, and the scientists are trying to figure out whether it's a dark moon with snow on it or if it's an icy moon with dust deposits on it. And it also has a, a mountain range around the equator that's taller than Mount Everest. And how did that form? And mm -hmm. so there are a lot of questions associated with that particular topic. So it was very interesting. Wow. Well, that's cool. I mean, because we see that stuff in the science media all the time, but we're not sure how much of it filters into the classroom. And so their their teachers must be talking about those topics um, for it to, to come up like that. Do you find differences as you um, judge the older kids versus the younger? So you talked a little bit. You know, sometimes maybe the topics that they choose might be different. But is there is there a group that's more difficult to judge in a way or? Well, the nice thing with the way we judge it is we have each judge just judges one category of the contest. So you'll get grade 7, 8, Titan, or you'll get grade 5, 6, F ring, or you'll get, you know, high school, Saturn. And so you're only comparing apples to apples. So hmm, you're, not have, you're not reading a 5th grade essay and then reading a 12th grade essay and say, wow, no. this is much better, right? <laughs> you're only reading essays within one grade category. So okay. there's no, um, no problem with that. Um, in terms of you know, are the older students more sophisticated? They often are. They often, you know, you can tell that they've had more years of education. Uh, sometimes the young, younger kids are more creative. Yeah. They haven't been told no so many times, you know, <laughs> this is how things work. And then sometimes you get, um, you know, students who surprise you. You know, somebody who writes about, you know, well, I know it's not a manned spacecraft, but if there were a person on it, what would they experience? Yeah. Right? Or, you know, someone will write and, and say, you know, I've been asked to choose which of these three targets to choose, and I'm choosing this one because. One of the things we want to steer away from is bashing the other two topics, because we are going to take all <laughs> the Well, sometimes you'll find that, you know, in having an argument, you'll say, well, I think mine is better because the other two are bad. Yeah, yeah right. Saying, we don't want to do that. Good choices. The question is, why is yours a good choice, not why are the other two bad choices? Yeah. We want to keep it positive. That's funny. Oh my gosh. And what about groups versus individuals? Um, yeah, any my, differences in yeah what you get from a group versus what you get from one person? We joke about things being by committee, and that's what came to my head. Well, it must be challenging to write it as a group because yeah. the individual within the group has their own opinions. 
And so, you know, I had a student last week write to me and say, I can't possibly convey all the information I want to about my topic in just 500 words. And I said, well, the same way that there are engineering constraints on building a spacecraft, is like, yes, of course you want to put way more instruments on it than you can possibly fit on it. But you have mass constraints, and you have power constraints, and you have safety issues, and you have all of these other things that are factors in deciding what to put on your spacecraft. You have a limit, a constraint of 500 words. Say as much as you need to in those 500 words to get your idea across. Yeah, but that's important. And you talk about scientists having to do a lot of writing, right? And so, exactly. If you can't keep your abstract, yeah, so many words, yeah. Right. If you can't keep your abstract to one page, they're not going to publish it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's the same thing with this contest: is you know, find what you think is the highlights, the most important things you want to get across, and say them in 500 words or less. And we're looking forward to reading them all. Yeah. In that case, the group. Uh, the project is like your collaboration. You're collaborating on a paper or a grant proposal and you have to get everyone's input. Right, and then you have the lead author and you have all the other supporting authors <laughs> contributed ideas to what final answer. Um, and you know, a lot of, of what's done even on the Cassini mission is done by teams. We have you know, teams of scientists who meet on a regular basis to discuss what's going on in ring science right now, what's going on in moon science, what's going on on Titan. And so they might have to collaborate to write a report on what they've discovered so far. And so it's very similar to what the students are doing. Yeah. Have you gotten a chance to talk to uh, many of the teachers that have had their students participate? Do you get any, you know, impressions, feedback? Oh, for me the most exciting teachers at all. The most exciting time for me is the five minutes before the video conference starts. <laughs> well, the teachers have to get their classes settled down because they're about to talk to NASA, and there's yeah, that's this fun. Just excitement that they're all just looking forward to talking to real NASA scientists. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. We do also do surveys for the teachers to say, what did you like about it? Did the students watch the videos? Did they watch them in class or out of class? You know, what could we do to make things better for next time we run the contest? Mm -hmm. And things like that. You know, do your students, you know, show more interest in science after having participated in the contest and things like that. Yeah, that would be great to know, definitely. So, you know, this contest having run for 12 years, have you, I don't know how long you've been personally doing it, but have you guys seen the change over the years in the essays, um, the type of essays you get, or maybe the, you have more meat behind that that the students can research from? Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, when, well, one of the other things I do is, is help choose the summer interns who are high school students who work at JPL. And there was a question we used to ask every year as part of the interview of if a spaceship landed in your backyard, would you get in? And if so, where would you want it to take you? Or where would you want to go? And that the answers to that question have definitely changed over time. Yeah. There was a year when nobody wanted to get in the spaceship. They were too scared. Was it right after Columbia? Nobody wanted to get in the spaceship. There was a year when people wanted to get in the spaceship and one kid said, I want to go, if I could go anywhere, I would go to the control room and find out how this thing works. So that's an engineer, not a scientist, right? Mm -hmm. That's somebody who wants to figure out how the space works. <laughs> not where, where could you go with it and what could you learn from exploring the universe, but how does this thing work, right? And then we had one student who said he wanted to go to Ohio because that's where his dad lives and it's cheaper than a plane ticket because this is free. And it's I, <laughs> sure, why not? It's, you know, some people wanted to go as far as they could to see what, what's out there. And some people wanted to go to a place that they've always wondered about. You know, show me Mars, show me Saturn, show me Pluto, show me another galaxy. Mm -hmm. So, although it wasn't scientists for today, there definitely have been changes over time and how that question has been answered. That's interesting. Uh, and of course, we, we have different essay topics every year, so we can't do, really do an apples to apples comparison, although there was another year that we had these three topics in a previous contest. So the one thing we're going to have our judges do is read the winners from that contest to make sure that they're not identical to the essays that we get. <laughs> from just finding winning essays on this topic and saying, this is a good essay on this topic, let's submit this. Uh, we are very uh, aware of plagiarism being an important issue in, in classrooms. And so if we do find an essay that's identical to somebody else's essay or identical to something we found online, word for word from Wikipedia or something like that, we will let the teacher know. Mm. Uh, we've actually in the past, unfortunately, had a few teachers who say, please don't give the student a certificate of participation. I found out it was plagiarized. Oh, wow. yeah. So the teachers are very aware of it as well. But for the most part, the students do a really good job of doing their own work and, and learning a lot and you know being creative. Uh, we definitely encourage students from diverse backgrounds to enter the contest. Um, over the years, we've had a real increase in the number of minority students, the number of girls, the number of students with disabilities who've entered the contest. The contest is open for all. It's not about winning, it's about playing. You know, 
participating in. Sounds like yeah, it's about learning that process. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so last year when we started having students with autism who were entering the contest, we thought it was wonderful because of course this contest is for them too, but we yeah. had never up to that point explicitly said so, but then we started promoting the contest among special ed teachers. And so they knew that this did definitely include their students, that you don't have to be the best writer in the world to enter the contest. Very cool. That NASA wants to hear from everybody. Have you heard of a student who really got um, interested because of this contest or carried, you know, their career plans, you know, in a different direction maybe further because of the contest? Yeah, definitely. We, um, we can only track the students who are not minors anymore. Mm -hmm. So anyone who was a high school student a few years ago who's now in college or, or who has now graduated from college, we do have some who went into science and some who went into engineering. It's hard to tell if it's cause or effect, whether they entered the contest because they were already interested in science mm -hmm. or if entering the contest made them more interested in science. Mm -hmm. But I do have a story of a student in Brazil who I met at JPL the week that Curiosity was landing on Mars. And she was invited with a group of other high school students from Brazil to California to be here on lab when Curiosity landed. Hmm. And I asked her how she got a chance to be here. I mean, it's a very special opportunity to be, you know, on site when something important like this is happening. And she said she found out about the Cassini Scientist for a Day essay contest that was being run in Brazil um, when she was, I think, 12 or 13. And she's been writing con essays for the contest ever since. And she ended up winning. But as a process, she was only looking for a writing contest. She wasn't looking for a science-related contest. But once she found out about it and did the background research, she got very interested in astronomy and joined her local astronomy club. And her astronomy club ran a some kind of event where you could go to um, the Mars Desert Research Station where you pretend Ooh. you're living on Mars. Yeah. And so there was the first high school-only Mars Desert Research Station group where these high school kids from Brazil. And so they were invited to the Mars Society's conference, which was being held in Pasadena in conjunction with the Curiosity landing. Right. And so she was basically here at the landing because of her interest in science, which started with the Cassini Scientist for a Day essay contest. So that made me very proud. And she That's got to meet Linda Silker, the chief scientist on the mission, while she was here. And there was these mutual admiration societies, like each of them thinks the other's great. Um, so it was really exciting to see yeah, that. Yeah, that's a fantastic story. Wow. Yeah. You never know. Nancy Graziano says, I wish I was in seventh grade again. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's like, oh man. <laughs> for it. I know, uh, me too. And uh, Dale Yount says, uh, we're talking about comparing different ages, um, his experience doing sidewalk astronomy. Uh, the older kids like when you tell a story along with the planet or object you're looking at, whereas the little kids just want to see the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cute story, too. Um, I have this audio clip from um, showing uh, some, I think they were in fifth grade by that point. I can't remember because I saw them three years in a row. Um, these uh, students we were working with, and just I caught their conversation as they were looking through a telescope. And, you know, how do you know this is Mars? Well, she said so. Well, how does she know? Well, she's an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> It's just really interesting to see them uh, work out that thought process. Well, I just remember the first time you see Saturn through a telescope, oh my God. and you've learned in school that Saturn has rings, and you've memorized that Saturn has rings, and you can write it down on a test, but seeing it with your own eyes through a telescope is somehow different. It just yeah. it changes you. Yeah. Because it's you say, wow, that really is out there, and you really can see it, you know, with binoculars or a small telescope. It is my favorite thing to show. It is my yeah. favorite thing to show. It wasn't up last night early enough um, for our, our our star party on campus, but yeah, yeah, you, you the wow and the oh my god and the did you put a sticker in there? <laughs> like, like they don't believe it's. Really they all think we put a picture at the end of the telescope, yeah. and that's what they're looking at. But yeah. if you show them the thing in the sky that's really bright, that that's what they're looking at, then. Yeah. Oh, what? I've had more than one person say, you know, literally, oh my god, it really does have rings. Yeah. But it's stuff about seeing it for yourself. Yeah. I think most things you look through a telescope, and I think to, you know, a globular cluster to a lot of people, it's like, okay, for the blob. Yay. <laughs> and, you know, comparing it to the Hubble images and the Cassini images and, and the ground-based telescope images that they, that they see online all the time. So when Saturn actually shows up the way it looks on the Internet, that's a big deal. <laughs> well, even you know, looking at the moon through a telescope, yeah. you can always tell 
if the telescope is out of focus because you you know you say can you see it they say yeah, yeah. it's like no no you can't see it or so, the tracking's gone bad so then you, you kind of fiddle with it and you get it nice and crisp and you get the oh wow and that's how you know they saw it <laughs> that's how I dealt with um a, a telescope that wasn't tracking properly one night because I put it on Saturday they didn't say wow I it wasn't tracking <laughs> <laughs> exactly. must not be right wait a minute. Right. Well, you can, like looking at Jupiter through the telescope and explaining to people as they're looking through it that this is what Galileo saw 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he drew what he saw and it didn't make sense because we didn't know that there were moons orbiting other planets. Mm -hmm. And how do you make sense of what you're seeing? You know, and so it's a teachable moment that you know science is changing as we get new information, but also that sometimes when you see something that doesn't make sense to you, you have to figure out what it is you're looking at. That's right. And try to make sense of something. Yeah. Rachel, we have, a, we have a wardrobe question. Hugo mm -hmm. Burnham wants to know where he can get a shirt like the one you're wearing. Because you're wearing an awesome Cassini Morgan right. polo. <laughs> a very cool shirt. Um, Land's End sells them. Okay. Really? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory has a gift shop, not surprisingly. And we have shirts from various missions. So you can get a Juno shirt or a Mars shirt or you know, Mars rubber shirt. Or Maybe that's where... Because we have NASA polos here at CosmoQuest. Maybe that's what we got. I think we got it from the lens. <laughs> I think we did. That sounds very familiar. Sounds familiar, but I was just the NASA logo. I didn't think they had all the missions. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, I was worried that would be a staff-only thing. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So about the, tell us more about the actual video conference with the scientists. And I'm, do the teachers, do you know the question sort of ahead of time, or is it completely like open where the students are just, you know, throwing out a question as it occurs to them? That's a really good question. Yeah, the way we've done it differently over the years. We used to do a teleconference, and then we graduated to video conferences for those schools that were capable of doing it at their end. And we do ask the teachers to send us their students' questions ahead of time so that we aren't completely thrown off guard with the kinds of questions we're getting, although that does sometimes happen as well. Yeah. Yeah. Also, if we know who the scientists are going to be, we can make sure that the questions are appropriate for that scientist. Okay. Or say, okay, you know, Todd, you're an engineer, you're going to answer the questions about how Cassini got to Saturn, and then, you know, Linda, you're a specialist in Saturn's rings, you can take the rings questions and so on. But sometimes they'll ask a question like, what's it like working at NASA? And that's a question that everybody on the panel will answer. We always have more than one scientist answering questions because one question has more than one answer depending on who's answering it. Yeah. The differences of opinion. Right. Yeah. Say, what's your favorite target? Which of these three targets would you have taken? Mm -hmm. like, well, you're going to get different answers depending on who you're asking. Mm -hmm. So part of it is to give students an idea that, you know, there's more than one type of scientist and more than one person, right? A scientist doesn't look like what your stereotype of a scientist is. Yeah. And part of it is is um, having the questions in advance really helps us make sure that we're not thrown for a loop and that we can, you know, maybe we need a prop to help answer the question. We can make <laughs> have it available, right? One time, somebody was talking about a moon that was too large to be, or too small to be round, so we brought in a potato. Said, well, here's how it spins, right? And so, you know, it can spin a long way or, or crosswise or, you know, yeah. far way. Yeah, great. So, oh yeah, so, so sometimes we use the digital learning network, which is a network of uh, video conferencing equipment that all the different NASA centers have to connect to classrooms. And in those cases, we can see the students and the students can see us. And that was done on a green screen at our end so we can put nice pictures in the background as they're talking about the hexagon. They can put up a picture of the hexagon. Um, sometimes we use JPL's TV studio and we do a three camera production. Wow. Um, and that's like an hour long and that's recorded. That usually goes to Ustream, so it's recorded. Um, you can either watch it live or watch it after the fact. Okay, yeah, I wondered about that too. Yeah, you to record so there them. Are ways that we do the video conferences depending on the audience. So when we do it with Ustream, we do it like a telephone call-in show. So we can't see the students, but they can see us. Right. And so with those, I usually end up being the the uh, telephone operator, <laughs> I'm trying to run <laughs> six phone lines at once and saying, oh. okay, you know, you're calling in from Cleveland, Ohio, and you have a question oh. about. You know, Saturn's rings, and then the next one is calling in from you know, yeah. New Jersey, and they're about height. <laughs> Bob from Chattanooga, you're on line one. <laughs> exactly, and then we have, you know, a moderator for the discussion who has an earpiece who's trying to listen to me telling her who's calling next. Oh, my gosh. Then, oh, wait, that, that line got dropped. Okay, well, we're going to take the next one from Massachusetts. Wow, logistics. Yeah. This is far more logistics than our hangouts here. <laughs> far more. No, I really like this. <laughs> yes, this is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh. Very well 
produced. That's really cool. So you get to so basically you win this contest. You get to talk to scientists, ask them your questions directly. Um, for participating students, get a certificate. Uh, the teachers you get to cover some important science and English standards. It's like a win win for everybody. Yeah. We also mail a package of NASA educational materials to teachers whose students participate in the contest. So that's kind of a nice bonus as well. Free swag. So yeah. didn't go to the National Science Teachers Association meeting in Boston last weekend. You can get your free swag. Another that's way. right. Yeah. If you weren't one of the twelve thousand lucky ones. <laughs> twelve thousand lucky ones. How many people were at that conference? I wasn't I wasn't there this year. Twelve thousand people, yeah. Wow. Wow. We, had, we only had five hundred of the solar system lithograph sets though and, and about I don't know, six or seven hundred of the uh, Curiosity and uh, Spirit and Opportunity litho sets. Yeah. So those went pretty fast. Uh, oh gosh. But yeah. Imagine. NASA booth is a teacher favorite. Yes. It just is. <laughs> and I was show showing eyes on the solar system, so if anyone hasn't had a chance to play with that, it's a way to play with the whole solar system. Um, all the planets, moons, asteroids, comets, and NASA spacecraft that are exploring these worlds, um, all from the comfort of your own computer. Uh, which is eyes.nasa.gov for anyone who's interested. Oh, right. it's a lot of I feel like that's something that I don't know if that came up door when we talked about apps. Oh, that's pretty in my browser oh. history. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's already remember. Yeah, I think it, um, I can't remember because we made a couple websites come up when we were asking people about their favorite mobile apps, but this yeah. is one of those websites you want to go to eyes.nasa.gov, so uh, explore the solar system. And and uh, it's funny, as I'm looking at it, a picture, you know, a, a artist conception of Cassini around Saturn <laughs> shows up. Um, and, yeah, the, the, the legacy of Cassini is, is in part going to be these, these gorgeous images um, yeah. that have come back. And they've, they, they continue to be stunning 10 years in. They continue to surprise us. Um, the, uh, I just, I uh, was looking at the Titan radar map of, of that came out yesterday with the sand dunes uh, on Titan. That 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 was a, a new one for me, and that was a really gorgeous image. So there's there's constantly new stuff to be to be exploring. And so asking these kids to, to think about it, it's going to prepare them for. Gosh, where do you think we'll be in the solar system when they grow up? <laughs> well, the students now are going to be the ones who analyze the Cassini data when they're grad right. students. That's true. That's true. Yeah, the day's going to be around for a long time. That's really cool. Excellent. Yeah, one of my favorite moons of Saturn is Enceladus, of course. It's been in the news a lot recently, but even before that, when we found out that it has active ice geysers that are feeding one of the rings of Saturn, yeah. I mean, what could be more interesting than that? Because this, for years, students have been asking, well, scientists also have been asking, where did Saturn's rings come from? Have they always been there? Are they coming? Are they going? Will they disappear someday? And we don't know where most of the rings come from, but the E-ring we can see being formed right now. Yeah. And we know that as Enceladus is orbiting Saturn and spewing out ice into you know, its orbital path around Saturn, it's creating one of the rings of Saturn. Wow. What is the... I'm going to delve into a science question now because the head pops up. Um, what is the current consensus on the, the age of the rings and, and how long they'll last? Oh, that's a that's a good question for Linda Spilker. So if you can get somebody to write okay. <laughs> Saturn rings, we can find out. Well, the neat thing is that the rings are constantly changing. Mm -hmm. We know that they're sorted around the planet by density and and by size. Uh, we know that the F ring, which is this very thin, tenuous ring around the outside of the main rings, uh, has kinks and braids and mini jets and all sorts of interesting features that are going on. <clears throat> Is the only uh, ring that has all those features, or is it just to... I don't know. You know, recently, another spacecraft found that Saturn has a ring that we can't even see. It's only visible in the infrared, and Ooh. it's much, much farther out. Now, for the main rings, the distance across is if you could tilt Saturn on its side and put the outer edge of the rings on the Earth, the other edge would just about touch the moon. Oh, the size of Saturn's rings is about the same as the, as the Earth-Moon distance. Earth-Moon distance. Uh, so, um, I'm gonna, yeah, the, um, the the outer ring of Saturn that was discovered in infrared, which I can... You can't see so much, but you can show an artist's conception of how big it is. Oh. Um, that was discovered using the Spitzer Space Telescope by a pair of astronomers at the University of Virginia while I was a grad student there. So I remember that happening and being like a big, big deal for us. Um, so if Saturn is Saturn in the infrared, Saturn is that size, that tiny little dot there, this is the ring. This is the big ring. Um, 
the, the, the largest one that they discovered uh, in the, with an infrared space telescope. So not using Cassini, using a, a, space, a Spitzer. Spitzer. I think it was Spitzer, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, again, new surprises, new surprises. And then, of course, I, I don't think we can talk about Cassini without showing, oh, this is a large image. <laughs> Oh, the backlit Saturn picture? Yeah, well, one of them. I don't know which one this is, uh, but uh, Cassini gave us a, you know, Cassini gave us a view of Saturn that we can't possibly get from Earth with the, the sun behind it. Um, so that, that particular image, which came out, like, the day we were doing um, an open night at the observatory, and so we put this on all the computer screens. <laughs> Just so you, even though none of us were working on Saturn that were there that night, we were <laughs> going to show it to everybody. Well, the neat thing is that Earth is in this picture, taken from about a billion miles away. Is it visible or is it not even? It's in one this picture. I don't know if it's in this particular one, but yeah. it's basically like the world's biggest selfie because we're all in it. Right, right. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that happening too, and I was in my basement office when that happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, we even had an event called Wave at Saturn. On yep. that. Oh, yeah. And yeah, we, we had everybody going outside and just waving at Saturn. And I was I was in my base office working on my poster for a conference <laughs> where we then talked about that. And I was like, oh, yeah, I missed that event. <laughs> I was so sad. Uh, Daniel Yump says he gets uh, emails from the JPL Ustream stuff. So that's apparently a way that you can email, uh, get email updates. Um, from the Ustream to see when they're doing stuff uh, there. Yeah, J JPL has two of its own Ustream channels. Uh, for a while it was it was streaming uh, Curiosity be being built, the Curiosity mm. camp, and you can just go online and watch it being built in the clean room. Uh, and then they also have like you know pre press conferences and things that are done on Ustream and then some, some school related events that are done on Ustream as well. So. Very cool, very cool. Um, I don't see any other questions. I see Nancy is already looking for the shirt. She can't find it yet. <laughs> so well, I think you need yeah. to have the code for the for that particular logo. Oh. They, like Lands End has like a business branch where they'll do you know logos of, of shirts for specific missions or projects or companies and things like that. So I don't know whether that's one that general public can get, but I know like the JPL has a store which I think has an online presence. So there should be a way to to find at least some of the. the okay. That so way. they may not have that specific one. That may be a team. Team. They may not have that specific one. Yeah. Sorry, right, guys. We got you. So, <laughs> <laughs> but there is a JPL store that you can get cool stuff. So that's great. That's great. I've never been to JPL. I would love to. Oh, come visit. visit. So. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, we are up on the hour, so I'm going to wrap up with a few announcements, and then we can one last um, plug for why you and your students should totally do this contest. Um, we have, uh, first of all, I wanted to note uh, Michael Jobin asked a comment uh, asking about how to deal with certain types of topics uh, in the classroom, like creationism, um, which is an interesting topic. And if, if you have suggestions for topics like that or people to go with topics, um, that's a, that would actually be a really cool topic to cover. We haven't done anything like that in learning space yet. Um, so that let us know if someone would be in mind. Really useful as well. Yeah. 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 Cause, cause we, <laughs> We did a discussion on, uh, so sometimes we do really fun things, and sometimes uh, we got into a somewhat more academic but really good discussion of, of communication styles, and and um, oh, that was last week, Georgia, when you were when you were in Barcelona. I don't feel bad. <laughs> I don't feel bad that you were left out of that one. <laughs> no, yeah, don't feel bad. <laughs> but that would be a good, that would be a good discussion. If you have um, show top ideas or. Uh, people that you'd like to see on the show, you can email us at educate at cosmoquest.org. If you put it in the comments now, I will probably lose it and forget. So email us at educate at cosmoquest.org and let us know what kind of things you want to see on the show. You can probably just tweet me at Lizzie Strong or at CosmoQuestX and we'll, we'll catch that too. Um, for Hangouts that are upcoming, uh, we have the usual lineup of Weekly Space Hangout on Friday. I think Fraser will be back, so he will rest power away from me. <laughs> <laughs> hosting last week's show, uh, and then uh, the virtual star parties on Sunday night at about 8 Pacific, uh, I think they're still doing that time. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's it's somewhere around Cosmos time. Uh, if you're watching Cosmos on the East Coast or Central U.S., watch it with me on Twitter, because I usually live tweet it and do some Cosmos mapping. That's a lot of fun. Not really a hangout, but it's an online thing. 
Um, Monday is the Astronomy Cast recording at noon Pacific, which is with Fraser and Pamela, assuming neither are on the road. Uh, and then that wraps back around to next Wednesday. We're going to have one more learning space at the late time because we promised a group who had a 6 p.m. meeting already to that we would do it with them. Uh, we'll be talking with a whole bunch of uh, high schools, uh, sorry, college college students who are going to be the future high school teachers in uh, Illinois, Texas, and a couple of other places. Where so uh, we're going to get to talk to some future teachers about the program that they're in right now next week on Learning Space. Yeah, That's actually is it six thirty? It's at six thirty. Yeah, because they convene around six, so it's 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 a half hour later than our old time. I promise I will put it in GMT in the email so you guys can figure out what you need to figure out. <laughs> and as always, these shows are archived on YouTube on the Astrosphere Vids channel and the audio is on 365 Days of Astronomy. Um, in fact, I'm going to ping Richard and Aviva if they can push this episode a little bit earlier since the deadline's coming up. Normally it won't come out till next week, but maybe we can get this one out earlier. So we'll see. Um, yeah, I think that's it for announcement type things. Um, oh, and you're, yeah, again, go do a Yuri's Night thing. Even if yes. you just have a white Russian and they <laughs> peer to, to humans in space, it's, it's cool. Um, so thanks uh, for watching. And uh, Rachel, do you have any last, uh, last thoughts about contest? I just want to say if, if any of you or your students do write essays for the contest, we really look forward to reading them. They're a lot of fun to read. Excellent, excellent. I kind of, I kind of wish, I kind of wish, I want to do something like that too. <laughs> that yeah. fun. All right, thank you everyone for joining us on this week's learning space, and we'll see you Thanks, next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Okay, bye.